Good evening, everyone. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout tonight. It was a little rainy this afternoon, so it's, uh, thank you all for coming out in a kind of a dreary, dreary evening. Thank you, Dennis, for the invitation to be here this evening. And when Dennis uh, invited me a couple months ago, I thought it would be a great opportunity to show showcase some of our uh, young scientists, our postdoctoral fellows, who are uh, really doing some outstanding work in the Indian River Lagoon. So I'm Valerie. I'm going to get us started today. And Let's go ahead and get started. So Dennis gave you a, a little brief history, and I thought I would just have a couple slides at the very beginning that told you a little bit more about the Smithsonian uh, in Florida. And of course, we're part of the uh, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., and administratively, we fall under the National Museum of Natural History. So in Florida, we've been here for 40-some years, since the early 70s. And as Dennis mentioned, we started off here on the Harbor Branch campus. And that picture on top there is the old barge that Dennis mentioned. And just, uh, just as he said, the first time I visited the Smithsonian Marine Station, it was on that barge. And we were doing some diving offshore uh, on the reefs off our coastline here near Pepper Park. So we moved to our new facility in 1999. We're over on Seaway Drive. And certainly uh, invite you all to come visit anytime. We do have monthly tours. And of course, invite you as well to come and visit the um, St. Lucie County Aquarium, which we <laughs> partner with St. Lucie County on uh, running all the exhibits and educational activities at the aquarium. So what do we do science-wise? Uh, the Smithsonian has a very broad mission of the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And uh, boy, that's, that's about as broad as it can be. But that was uh, James Smithson's um, uh, intention when he first gave the donation to, to start the Smithsonian to Congress. And, uh, Within the Smithsonian, there are sort of four grand challenges that they've laid out. And the one that most of our work falls under is understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet. We work all around the Indian River Lagoon, the Florida coastline. Uh, we, we do some work on both coasts of Florida, but really um, focus a lot on this region of Florida. And this marine station has over 1,100 publications on uh, work on marine biology, ecology, studies of biodiversity, what species are out there, what's their distribution and biogeography, and some evolutionary studies as well. So uh, one of the projects I just want to mention, because it kind of leads into our talk this evening, is a long-term benthic monitoring study of the Southern Indian River Lagoon and St. Lucie Estuary. And this uh, study has been going on for 10 years now. Uh, it's currently funded by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it was first initiated by one researcher, Bjorn Thunberg, at the laboratory, and currently managed by a, a another uh, person, C. McKeon. So this uh, project has taken quarterly samples at a variety of sites in the uh, St. Lucie Estuary. You can see the sites here and the southern Indian River Lagoon. So we don't really sample uh, right uh, north of Fort Pierce right now. The green dots here are the currently uh, active sites that we've been monitoring for this full time. The, some of the red dots were uh, initiated early on, but uh, we're not continuously monitoring those. Um, we've also extended up a little bit in the Vero Beach area uh, with some other funding. But uh, as I mentioned, this, this study has been going on for some time and is starting to give it, yield some insights into uh, the distribution of animals, uh, how these uh, soft sediment dwelling animals can give us indications of the health of the Indian River Lagoon. That particular study led us to become involved in this uh, other project, which is really the crux of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, it's looking at uh, surveying and, and, care, and grazing characteristics of animals in the in northern Indian River Lagoon system. And this is part of a much bigger project that the St. John's River Water Management District is uh, sponsoring, an IRL harmful algal blooms investigation. And the names listed here are just, just the people in our team that are working on this uh, at the Smithsonian. There are uh, other uh, researchers at other institutions. Dennis Hanasak is involved, uh, other, other researchers here at Harbor Branch. Uh, as well as researchers from FIT, uh, a couple of folks in the audience I know are working on this, uh, on this program. So it's a much larger program. And the impetus for this program really was trying to understand some of the uh, major algal blooms that we've had in the, in River, in the Indian River Lagoon uh, over the last uh, three or four years that have led to what many of us have read about in newspaper articles and on television, uh, die-offs of seagrass and other things. So, 
Here uh, you see from a recent paper a kind of the um, a graphic, uh, graphical images of this uh, superbloom that occurred in 2011. And we still don't fully understand the cause of this, but uh, what you see in the, in the picture here is the redder colors, the oranger colors, are very high chlorophyll levels, which are indicative of a high concentrations of microalgae or phytoplankton in the water column. And just look at how we um, progress through the fall there. By October, most of the waterways were very, very densely um, covered by what became known as the super bloom because it was so intense and so broad throughout the northern Indian River Lagoon system. Uh, and you begin to see it start to fade in November and December. But then there was a second bloom in 2002 that also caused some problems. And of course, what happens when the algal densities in the water, become, water column become so dense is that it starts to block the light to uh, anything, any photosynthetic organisms on the bottom. And that's what really caused a lot of the damage to the seagrass uh, populations that we've heard about. So for any kind of uh, bloom or of algae, whether it's macroalgae, uh, like, sea, sea, like seaweeds, or microalgae, like these phytoplankton, um, or, or plants on land, for that matter, uh, they can be controlled in a couple of different ways, from uh, nutrient enrichment and light, of course, fuels plant growth. But additionally, grazing can control those populations. The algae can start to grow, but if the herbivores can keep pace and eat it, then you don't really get what we often refer to as a bloom, which is, is these very, very large, uh, out-of-control populations of algae. So our whole focus in... A, in the IRL Blooms Investigation Program is from this uh, herbivory angle, what ecologists often refer to as top-down control on the algae because it's uh, consumption of the algae. And trying to understand better what kinds of things eat these microalgae in the lagoon, uh, how that might help control algal blooms. And really get, getting at whether these filter feeding organisms can provide mitigation against um, algal blooms. And so on this uh, picture, you see some of the different uh, filter feeding organ organisms that are common. These are ascidians here and here, and barnacles, very important, bryozoans, uh, oysters, and sponges. We'll be talking a little bit about or mentioning something about almost all of these tonight. And uh, all of them feed on particles in the water and can feed on microalgae. So as part of the project, we're looking at both in fauna, and that means the sediment dwelling animals, so the things that live down in the sediments, as well as uh, what we're calling epifauna, which is things growing on uh, solid surfaces like dock pilings or sea walls or any uh, mangrove roots, anything that uh, things can attach to. So this project's been going on since early last year, since early 2014. Our very first uh, thing we did was go out and survey 90 sites all up and down the Indian River Lagoon system. So we have, you know, all, all the water bodies, the Mosquito Lagoon, the Banana River, and the Northern Indian River Lagoon all surveyed as part of this. And uh, this was to go out and get a good, try to get a good idea of what the biodiversity of the organisms was, a little bit about their distribution, how similar the sites were, and that sort of thing. And from that, we selected 27 sites that became sort of our permanent monitoring sites for the duration of this project. So every quarter now, we go out and collect in-fauna samples, so sediment samples, and epifauna samples from these sites and uh, bring them back to the laboratory and study everything that's in them, basically. So for the in-fauna now, which are shown up, uh, uh, up there, we the, we do the sampling with uh, this thing called a petite ponar. It's like a grab sampler, like a big set of tongs or something that snaps closed, catches the sediment, come up with a, a, a blob of sediment about this much, and then it's uh, sieved through meshes so that we retain everything that's greater than uh, half a millimeter in size, so 500 microns. And um, those things are then all uh, sorted and uh, preserved and brought back to the laboratory where uh, where the, some of the real work begins. And at the same time, we get environmental parameters while we're out there. So um, they're just a snapshot, of course. They're just a, a sample while we're out there. But we'll get temperature and salinity and oxygen and everything 
uh, during the actual sampling period. And as I mentioned, the lab work is pretty intense uh, in, these, in these in faunal studies. Uh, you're sorting through sand grains, coarse uh, bits of shell hash, and other things to pick out the actual little animals and identify them and enumerate them all. So we have, uh, fortunately, a, a couple of very talented um, technicians working on this project, um, Katrina Bayless and Michelle Stevens in the lab and others who have been, been helping them, who have really become experts in some of this fauna. And uh, these are across the bottom, you just see examples of some of the kinds of things that we pick out of there. And just to show you a, a little bit of uh, data and some of the kinds of uh, animals we find and where they're located in the Banana River, Mosquito Lagoon, and Indian River, uh, you see some similarities in the, in the animals that occur, but the overall composition can be a little bit different from site to site in terms of what animals are most abundant, uh, which are less abundant. We've got now about five sampling periods uh, and we're beginning to see maybe some hints of some seasonality that we will try to follow up on a little bit better. And so in terms of summarizing some of this in faunal work, which really uh, won't be the focus of the rest of the talk, we're seeing a lot of variation uh, from site to site in the predominance of different kinds of organisms. But we feel like now after about a year and a, and a half of sampling, we're starting to get a good picture of the diversity of these animals and there's hundreds of species of animals that we find in these sediments. So it's really a, a very diverse assemblage. Some, are, of course, aren't as abundant as others, and the ones I showed you tend to be the most abundant, but really uh, quite, a, quite a broad diversity. And to really pick up the seasonality, we'll uh, continue sampling for the next uh, year and a half, and hopefully maybe after a few years, really start to see if these se seasonal pattern patterns are predictable and co-occur every year. Now for the epifauna, this is looking at the things growing on hard substrate like pilings, docks, seawalls, mangrove roots. Uh, we're assessing the diversity and abundance uh, by percent cover. Some of this is done by video transect means. Some of this is done by scraping things off and bringing them back to the lab and identifying them. So it's kind of a, a mixed uh, methodology. Uh, we're also deploying these recruitment panels, which are just um, plastic panels that are 10 centimeters on a side and they're hung out on the docks. So every quarter that we go, every time we go back to a site, every quarter we deploy a new uh, settlement panel. And this also gives us an idea of the kinds of animals that are present in every site. And you may not be able to identify everything here, but um, you can see that there are some real differences among these panels that come from different sites. This one has a lot of barnacles on it, and these tube worms, these little white things, uh, tube, tube building worms. Uh, we have a lot of bryozoans on this one. This one tends to have a lot of tunicates, and this one kind of has a, mix, a mixture of barnacles and others. So um, fortunately, we have some um, people at the lab that are very talented at identifying these animals and uh, have been studying recruitment panels for a long time. So they're really, uh, really good at um, identifying everything. And just some initial results on these epifaunal samples. Uh, we see on the graph there, you're, gonna, you're seeing the species richness, which is just the number of species uh, on average on, at each site. And what we see here is that we didn't really see any uh, notable differences by region. Uh, that is, whether the, we looked at the Banana River, uh, Mosquito Lagoon, or Northern Indian River. But we see some clear separation by habitat type, a little bit higher uh, species numbers on the artificial uh, habitat like seawalls and the, that sort of thing than we see on the mangrove roots. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and all, already we've got, you know, over 100 species and that was just in the first sampling period so we have probably 200 or so now. But I want to point out this one animal that's really dominant. This is the barnacle, Amphibalanus eburneus, and it's really one of the few dominant things that's there. And uh, we also see, of course, sponges, uh, cnidarians, bivalves, all sorts of other animals. But what you see in this graph is the percent cover of barnacles, and you know, 100% would be the whole entire surface covered with nothing but barnacles. And you can see that at some of these sites, we approach that with 80% or more of the uh, substrate covered with barnacles. So there, this, is, this one is extremely abundant, and um, Chris is going to come back and tell us a little bit more about this barnacle. So in terms of our uh, current and future directions, we're going to be continuing to monitor these sites quarterly for both uh, the infauna and the epifauna. 
And then a couple of other areas where we're really find, finding some interesting results are in the sampling for stable isotopes. And Chris is going to come up now and tell us a little bit more about that work. And then following that, Eve will come out, up and talk to us about some of the grazing experiments she's been doing with dominant species like um, oysters and clams. So let me go ahead and oops, get Chris up here. Okay, well, thanks, Val. Um, I'd like to start off by just showing you um, a few more photos of the overall diversity of these filter feeding organisms in the IRL. So you have very colorful tunicates. Um, this is also a tunicate, but it, it's a solitary tunicate. Uh, sponges grow in many locations. This is a bryozoan, um, different types of bivalves. Um, you also have other mollusks, two worms, uh, another example of a mollusk, and finally the barnacles. And so really our question right now is figuring out what the diets of these organisms um, is. What are these organisms eating? What's their role in these ecosystems? And so filter feeders have several different methods for, for feeding. So some, like this bryzoan and these barnacles here, they have these specialized structures. You can think of them as tentacles or fans. And so, for instance, with a barnacle, uh, when a barnacle is feeding, this fan or um, uh, comes out of the shell and sort of pulses in the water column. And because this fan has these very small hairs on it, these hairs capture very small particles in the water column, and then the, the barnacle is able to bring those to its mouth and digest them. So that's the way that one, one set of organisms feeds. Another set, um, which Eve is going to talk a lot about, uh, which is bivalves. Bivalves and another group called tunicates, they actually actively pump water into their bodies, and they run the water either through their gills, in the case of bivalves, or in the case of tunicates, it's sort of like a mesh or a, a fine sieve. And so uh, particles that get caught in this, in this mesh or sieve can then be consumed. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, sponges. So sponges are not, not that common in the IRL, but they, they're very common in other areas of, of, the, of the oceans. And so sponges actually, they pump water into their body by a coordinated movement of just single cells. And sponges are extremely good at filtering water. Um, this is an example of uh, this sponge here is, uh, this is a video I actually took of a sponge in uh, the Caribbean, uh, off the Caribbean coast of Panama. So it doesn't quite look like the IRL, but it's, uh, so this, this yellow dye is just used to visualize the movement of water. And so what I'm going to do is when I press play, you'll see me release some of the dye from the syringe. And the sponge very rapidly will take this dye up. And what it's doing as it does that, it's filtering that water of bacteria. And then some of these holes here, this is actually sort of like the, it's where the filtered water comes out. So there's the dye that's been released. And you can see within a couple seconds, the sponge has filtered that dye, and then it's come out of these holes. So this is sort of a view of a filter feeder in action. Like this is what they do all day, every day. And so a sponge, if you think of, of a sponge that's the size of a gallon of milk, um, a good rule of thumb is that th that sponge could filter the same volume every day as a residential swimming pool. So somewhere around 20,000 gallons, so a lot of water. And it's removing up to 80% of the bacteria from that water. Now, to determine what they eat, that's a little bit, um, a little bit tougher. So one thing that filter feeders eat is lots of phytoplankton. So Phytoplankton, just um, photosynthetic organisms, the very small to uh, a little bit larger in the water column. And then zooplankton. So zooplankton are usually a little bit bigger than phytoplankton, but both of these groups of organisms are very prevalent in coastal waters, especially those in the IRL. And so together, these two groups are known as particulate organic matter. And so that just means that they're, they're particles, sometimes very small, they're in the water column, and they're organic. So organisms like um, filter feeders consume them in order to get their food. Now, one way to, de to determine what an organism eats is to do gut content analysis. Um, so it's just like it sounds. You take its guts, and you go through them, and you try to figure out what it's been eating. But this, is, uh, this gives you a snapshot in time. So it's what the organism was eating maybe five hours ago, maybe a little bit less. So it doesn't necessarily reflect 
uh, the, the average diet that an organism consumes. It could just be um, what it's eaten that day. Another way is uh, isotope analysis. And so isotope analysis provides an estimate of diet over time because you're actually analyzing the tissue of the animal to look at what it's been eating. And it also tells you what the dominant source of nutrients that the animal's been consuming. In this case, for this talk, we're just going to talk about uh, carbon and nitrogen as the nutrients. And this is expressed, these isotope values are expressed in delta notation. Um, I know it's, you, you definitely don't need to know what that means, but just know that when, I, when you see this delta 13C, we're just going to refer to that as the carbon isotope, and this delta 15N as the nitrogen isotope value. Now, have you guys heard the term you are what you eat? So that's, um, that definitely applies to isotope analysis. So I'm going to do a little experiment with everyone in the room here. And so uh, isotope analyses, the, the, the data that you get from that is usually expressed in this biplot. So you have uh, your nitrogen isotope values on one axis and your carbon on the other. And so if I were to take uh, hair samples or very small hair samples or nail samples from 35 people in this room just randomly, they would and those represented these red dots, and then I analyzed them for isotopes, you might get something that looks like this. So you'd get this grouping of values, and then we can figure out what each of you is eating, right? So in the, in the human food web, nitrogen is going to tell you essentially uh, if someone's a vegetarian or if someone eats a good balanced diet of vegetables and meat or if someone's a hardcore carnivore. And so at the base of the human food web are vegetables, and so vegetarians would be one step above this because they're consuming these vegetables directly. Then you have vegetarians, so people that enjoy vegetables but also enjoy the occasional hamburger or bacon, um, or an omnivore, so someone who has a more balanced diet. Then you have carnivores, people that eat mostly just meat and very little vegetables. And then you have people that eat a combination of meat and also people that eat uh, fish like tunas or sharks that are by themselves at the top of their food chain. So they would have very, very high nitrogen values. And then carbon values, they tell you in the human food web, carbon values tell you about the relative consumption of either rice or wheat or corn. So really the take home message from this slide is that these different groups in this, in this figure show you uh, organisms that have different diets from each other. So the variation in this the graph reflects different diets. Now, we're not talking about humans, so we're talking about these filter-feeding organisms that live in the IRL. And so to look at their diets, we do a very similar thing. We take their tissue samples and we analyze them the exact same way. The first question was to look at how diverse are their diets. And so to do this, we have the same, almost the same exact graph, except it has real data on it. These are 11, uh, these are 11 species of common filter feeders in the IRL. Um, obviously, these are scientific names, so you don't have to know what they are, but just know that they represent a wide variety of, of different species. You have barnacles, you have the tunicates that I showed you, you have, uh, there's no sponges, but you have um, different bivalve species, so it's a, it's a wide range. And so what I, based on what I talked about before, if all of these different animals were grouped together, that would mean that they had a very similar diet. So these data are not the actual data from this experiment. If you look at the actual data, you can see that they're spread, spread out quite a bit on this figure. So you have um, this one here, this pink value has very, very low carbon values, while this one over here from the IRL has very high. So those organisms likely have distinct diets. And there's even some differences in this little grouping here in terms of sort of where they sit in this figure. It suggests that they have unique diets. So some of these organisms might be consuming more of the zooplankton group, some might be consuming more phytoplankton, or even some of them might be uh, feeding on specific size of the phytoplankton, whereas others might be feeding on a different size. Now, Val mentioned that the barnacles were, were one of the most abundant and dominant species all throughout the IRL, and they're at pretty much every single site, like she said. We've already seen a photo of this settlement plate. So you can put the settlement plate out completely clean, and then in three months, it's almost completely covered with barnacles. They're also on mangrove roots. So any site you go to, if you pick up a little mangrove root, it's usually covered in barnacles, and also man-made structures like docks, bridges, and uh, pilings. So because barnacles are pretty much at every single site, um, we really wanted to look at how barnacle diets shift uh, throughout the IRL. 
So what are they feeding on in different areas of the IRL? And also look at if, they're, if their feeding is uh, specific. So are they eating the same thing at each site, or are they feeding on just local sources at each site? So just general particulate matter at each site. So to do this, we went to the, uh, Val was talking about the 27 sites earlier. So we went to, we actually added three sites, went to 30 sites in the IRL. And so this spans all three of the lagoons. So you have uh, Mosquito Lagoon, this is the Indian River Lagoon, and this is Banana River or Banana Lagoon. And uh, at each site we collected uh, barnacles. So we got 10 species or 10 individuals of barnacles at each site. We also got water. And so the water is used to get an estimate of uh, the isotope values of particulate organic matter, which is all these, um, all these particles that we talked about earlier, so phytoplankton or zooplankton. And so if you take a bucket of, of water from the IRL and you filter it through this very fine filter, what you get is this sort of, uh, well, it depends on what site you go to. Some sites are very green, some sites are very brown, so it really depends. But that's uh, what you're catching on this filter is, is all of this particular organic matter that these filter feeders could be consuming. And so we took the barnacle tissues and we took the water samples, the particular organic matter, and we analyzed their isotope values. With the question, are barnacles selective feeders and how does their diet vary across the IRL? So you have the same graph that we've seen before. And these are the barnacle isotope values from 30 sites. And they're color coded by lagoon, but you can see that that doesn't really necessarily tell the whole story. So the mosquito sites are somewhat grouped, those four sites there but the banana and IRL sites are pretty much all over the place. So these diets are extremely diverse uh, across these sites, suggesting that these barnacles might be consuming, uh, have different diets um, throughout this IRL. Now we wanted to follow this up by looking at the relationship between the isotope values of particulate organic matter and the isotope values of, of barnacle tissues with the prediction that if barnacles are um, are just feeding on general sources of organic matter in the water and are not being selective, that there would be a very strong relationship between these two. And indeed, there is. So this is, uh, you're looking here at the relationship between the nitrogen isotope values of particular organic matter and the nitrogen isotope values of barnacle. And you can see that at sites with higher nitrogen values, those barnacles also have high nitrogen values. And so that just suggests that these barnacles are feeding on sort of whatever particulate matter is present in the water, and they're not being selective. They're not selectively removing a specific item from that, from that group at all these different sites. They're just eating what's there. The same trend is, is uh, apparent for carbon. So it just, um, it's, it's well supported with both the nitrogen and the carbon isotope. So barnacles are not selective. So in conclusion, these filter feeding communities are very diverse. Val showed you some photos of these organisms, and I've shown you some more photos. And, but it's not just about their, their taxonomic diversity, it's also about their, their diverse diets. And so this is just another example of how biodiversity is important. So the more biodiversity uh, sites with the more filter feeders, it's likely that more of these particles will be removed every day by these filter feeders. And this is playing an important role in the lagoon, not just in terms of helping keep the water clean, but also some of these uh, filter feeders might be capable of consuming harmful algal blooms, which is as Val mentioned, is the, is the theme of our current research. Now barnacles are especially um, interesting because they're present everywhere. And so you can think of the, as barnacles feed, they're, they're taking a sample every single day, every minute of every day that they're feeding, they're, they're sampling those local conditions. And as they grow, they're taking that food and that signal and they're incorporating it into their tissue. And so this is very powerful because we can, we can show up to a site and we can collect, we can collect barnacles and we can measure that signal and we can determine what's been going on at that site over the last couple months. Um, so I've shown you that these barnacles are recording what's going on at sites throughout the IRL, but we're also collecting these barnacles every uh, four months. And so that's showing us how these sites are changing over time as well. So it's a, it's a very powerful method to look at, at what's going on in local ecosystems. And of course, there's other filter feeders in the IRL. Um, so uh, oysters and also uh, clams. So these used to be, historically, these used to be a very dominant and abundant uh, organism throughout the lagoon. And so this is uh, Jack Island, a site uh, quite close to the Smithsonian Marine Station. And then this is up in um, Canaveral National Seashore. And so both of these represent 
relatively healthy uh, oyster reefs. They're kind of small, but they're relatively healthy. And so Eve uh, is going to talk to you a little bit about um, two, uh, two bivalve species, the oyster and the clam in the IRL, and what their feeding uh, biology is like. So thank you. Thank you. Um, hmm. So as Chris was mentioned, we kind of understand how filter feeders find their food and what they do with it. But I'm a bivalve expert, so I want to go deep into how, how they're eating. So I hope you understand with it, and it was clear from before, they pump water into their bodies and from this water, they're going to get all these microorganisms that we talk about, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton. They can also even get other teeny tiny particles that are in there. And what they're going to do is they're going to push this water through their gills. So their gills are going to act like this mesh that you see over here. And if the particle is way too teeny tiny, it's going to go through the gills and it's going to be released back to the water. But if the particle is big enough to be retained, it's going to stay on the gills, and they're going to move these particles from the gills to their mouth, and they're going to select. They're going to decide if they want to put these particles inside their mouth, or they want to throw it away, and I don't like it. So there's a choice of being ingested, but there's also the chance of, I have the particle in there, but I really don't want it. And I'm going to talk later about pseudophysis, and pseudophysis come from this rejection before the ingestion. Um, this is uh, one of the algal blooms that bloom here, uh, and Valerie talked about, the super bloom in 2011. We have it culture in the lab. And I just wanted to show you that this is a very, very thick culture, and it's made out of thousands and millions of these teeny, tiny phytoplankton cells. It's hard for people to understand what phytoplankton is because we cannot really see it. So these are the teeny tiny cells. This is just an example of what bivalves filter. So I wanted, first, when I came here, um, there was lots to do. So one of my first approaches was, um, how are the oysters and the clams here? I had heard a lot of, about restoration project on oysters. I heard that. There was a big clam fishery a long time ago, so I wanted to see what they were doing. Um, why? Because there's a lot of the oyster reefs have disappeared, um, and it has a lot of ecological and economical consequences. And because the last I know, maybe you know better than me, but the last I know is that the last clam fishery developed in the Indian River Lagoon lasted from 1981 to 1985, and after that period, there are clams, they live here, they've been here always, but they just don't thrive. They don't seem to be very happy, and I wanted to know what was going on. So I wanted to compare oysters and also to see, we're restoring with oysters, are they going to be okay? And then see what happened with the clams, what, what's going on between those two species? So we did all these filter feeding experiments. We chose a location in each one of the three lagoons. And we did several experiments in March and August, just this year. Um, these are the devices that we're using. These are portable devices. They're heavy, but they're portable. Um, so I'd like to explain how they work. This is a proof that they exist, but I'd like to explain how they work with this diagram. So you set your underwater pump, whatever you want to do the study. It pumps the water up these two common chambers. There's air in the chamber just to make sure that all the particles are removed and there's no precipitation of anything. And then from this chamber, we have teeny tiny um, tubes that go to each one of the individual bivalves that I have there. These little laces are uh, to control the flow, so I know that everyone is receiving the same flow, and then the water flows through the bivalve and then exits the chambers. And, and as you can see, we always have controls because 
we are using these devices um, based on tracing the inorganic matter from the water and from the animals. So what we are going to collect, and that's what it is, it's the feces. So we're going to collect what they poop out. So we're going to collect the sildo feces, so everything that was on the gills but they don't want to eat. And then we're going to collect water. And everything goes through this uh, filter apparatus, we call it the filtration station. And we are going to study the organic matter and the inorganic matter of these three different components. So just to show you that it's true and we work, this is one of our setups. So these are pictures taking every few minutes, putting them all together in a minute. So as you see, everything is portable. We have a huge van, though. Um, we set up the feeding devices. We set up here. You can already see the water going down. Um, we set up um, the filtration station. And we sit there after two hours. You can barely stand up. Um, and we do the whole experiment for the whole day. It's two hours taking water samples and feces and cell feces samples. So with the samples, we go back to the lab. We dry them, and then we also put them in the oven, and we get the ashes, and that's how we get the organic and the inorganic. And what do we do with those numbers? So we're going to study the feeding behavior, and what does it mean? So it means we can estimate the volume of water that goes through their gills. So that's how many liters per hour circulate through their gills. So with it, because the water is carrying whatever we want to eat, we're going to know how many particles, so the milligrams per hour, of things that we're going to be, we're going to have retained on the gills. So as you all already know, not everything that I have retained, I'm going to eat, because I don't like it for whatever reason, and I'll let you know later. So those are going to be still the feces, so we can estimate how much of this material is rejected. Once we are inside the bivalve, so this represents being inside their digestive system, we can calculate how much is the ingested matter, how much organic, how much inorganic, many other things that I'm not talking about. And very importantly, what is the efficiency of the whole feeding process? So how efficient I am, and I always call it like how happy I am in this environment. So going to results, first of all, I want to talk about the water that we have. So this is the total particulates matter, like everything. And this is just going to be the inorganic matter. So silt is the main component of the particulate matter. It means that when we have more things, this more is silt. So when you see more color in the water and people said, oh, it's super colorful, they're going to have so much. Mm -mm. Not really. They're going to have a lot of silt to deal with that's going to go through their gills, and that's not going to be very helpful for them. So also, that can trick us a little bit. We can think, OK, Mosquito Lagoon is the one that has more total particulates, as you can see over here. And I'm just plotting all the data from all the experiments, from all the seasons, because I want to make it simple. But that was repeated throughout all the different experiments. There's more in mosquito, they might have more things to eat. Nope. They have more things to eat in, uh -huh, in Banana River. So even if I have more total, I have less organic. That means they're going to be more sealed. So there are going to be some issues in the mosquito while in the banana, even if they have less total. Out of this less total, there's much more organic. I hope you're following. OK. So uh, what happens with the animals? So I just uh, plotted a couple of this feeding behavior. First, we're going to see how much water goes through the gill, so how many liters per hour. And as you see, everywhere, oysters filter much more than clams. So oysters are better pumps. They just filter more, and there's nothing we can do with it. Uh, as you can see, it can go up to 
two liters per hour. That's kind of half a gallon per hour, I think. But if we look at the whole efficient, efficiency of the process, we look at how happy they are, even if oysters were always taking more water through their gills, Banana River is the site where both oysters and clams can be as happy or as unhappy. Um, and only here, oysters do much better than clams. And remember, the Banana River is the one that has less total but higher organic. So what's going on? If we put all the data together, and now is when you get totally lost. Um, Oysters, we know they filter more, there's more water, and therefore there are more particles going through the gills, and that's, as I said, because they're better pumps. But oysters are very good at rejecting the material that don't want to ingest. So they produce huge amounts of pseudofeces, if you remember the name. So because they do that, they can increase the organic matter on the gills so they can increase the organic matter that they end up ingesting. So even if there's a lot of inorganic outside, they don't care, they're gonna sort it out and they're gonna ingest the organic matter, which is what they want. So the efficiency of the whole process goes up to 60%. But poor clams, they're not good at that. So the more matter you have in the water, the more seal they're gonna end up ingesting because they cannot pre-sort it. So they cannot increase the organic matter inside their stomach, and therefore their efficiency is much lower. Ta -da. <laughs> so nobody remembers any number, but just remember the smile. So going back to the very beginning of the talk, can little animals help the health of the lagoon? Yes, they can, because as we know, and the three of us have talked about, they're little pumps and they filter everything that's in the water. But the way water is now, we do not recommend using clams for restoration purposes because they're not going to be happy out there. As we know also, barnacles are not picky. They're not picky eaters, uh, but bivalves are. But that doesn't mean we want barnacles all over and we need to get rid of the bivalves. Biodiversity is very, very important. So they all have their role. They all need to be out there. We just want to know where they're going to be better and why we have these abundances. So if you want more information, um, there's been a video released in Water as Habitat series, and we also have um, the newsletter outside. I don't know if you saw it and if you want to grab it and go through it. And there's news also on Florida today about all the research that we're doing. And I just wanted to thank the funding agency and everyone that's been really so helpful to us because without so many hands, we wouldn't be doing as much as we're doing. Thank you.